He now had his final epiphany. The one relationship that mattered most to Byron came to a sudden tragic end. The Shelleys had joined him in Italy. Then Shelley drowned in a storm at sea. Byron took part in the cremation of his body on the beach at Via Reggio. In Shelley's death, Byron's life took a new turn. And he determined that like Don Juan, he would take up arms and make the world a better place. And of course, he would do so in a uniquely Byronic way. Byron must have looked into these flames and uh, thought, how can I trump this? On his first great foreign adventure in 1809, Byron had paid homage to the great classical culture whose literature and civilization he'd so admired since school days. His admiration for all things Greek had left a lasting impression. And now, 14 years later, he was determined to support his beloved Greeks in their fight for freedom from the Ottoman Empire. Excuse me, I'm looking um, for some military costumes. Military. Resolving to join the Greek independence fighters, he decided to raise an army, but in a very Byronic way. I'm looking for um, hats that Lord Byron might have worn. In the later parts of Byron's epic poem, Don Juan becomes a soldier, and Byron was now determined to imitate his own creation. He decided to fit out himself and his motley band of friends, servants and distant relations in appropriately stylish military uniform and went to an operatic costume designer in Geneva to do so. In the back of his mind already is the legendary idea of Byron's brigade freeing Greece from the clutches of the Ottoman Empire. A kind of power-hungry, syphilitic dream. I mean, that's what syphilis is like. It, it gives delusions of, of grandeur. And I sometimes wonder if he is, at this stage, syphilitic. It's such a crazy thing to be doing. I think he is seriously at the end of the road here, uh, trying on, you know, costumes with epaulets to make him feel like the person he should be. I mean, he really is an actor. I mean, so it's, it's quite ironic that he ends up in a theatrical costume is, you know, choosing his outfit for the next act, for the uh, grand climax of this extraordinary life. Inspired by Napoleon, emulating Don Juan, flattered that he might be king, the lame boy had been transformed into a revolutionary hero. Sailing on his final adventure, Byron fantasized about a Greek republic with himself as leader, a nation in his own image, one to which he could finally belong. Byron was heading for here to take part in the war between Greece and Turkey. Um, he'd been sent by the London Greek Committee, um, who had promised a large amount of money, £800,000, which in those days was a lot. And he was basically coming to administrate it. Actually, they, they pulled the wool over his eyes slightly. He was really there just uh, as a kind of piece of ornamentation. He, of course, uh, wanted one last adventure slash death scene with which to propel himself into uh, posterity. Byron had hired a boy called Lucas to join the military enterprise and reverting to his youthful interests he fell in love with him. But by now Byron had lost his luster and Lucas was utterly indifferent. Come on. And it wasn't just on the personal side that Byron's aspirations were being confounded. He arrived at Missolonghi to find a degree of chaos, with various factions trying to make use of him and his fame. Byron protested that he didn't want to join a faction, but a nation. The Greeks still celebrate his support for their national cause, just this year naming an annual Byron Day. But for Byron himself, it was hardly heroic. In many senses, the nearer he got to Missolonghi, the more he wanted to go back, uh, but he couldn't let himself vanity, pride, this idea of his own um, posterity, I think was always in the back of his mind. And he had no way out, he was in a trap. Surrounded by disappointments and already in bad health, 
Byron went riding in a downpour through the malarial swamp of Missolonghi. He caught a fever and never recovered. So, Byron died here, on the edge of a swamp, at the fringes of the fray, his usual position, holding the hand of his Venetian gondolier. Wobbly-toothed, overweight, balding, no longer mad, bad and dangerous to know, just mad, perhaps, to even be here in the first place. Hopelessly in love with an arrogant boy, disillusioned with his brothers in arms, far away from all the friends so studiously shunned over the years, but who he missed nonetheless. Byron's death was a million miles away from history's portrait that he so earnestly helped to construct. The final glaze was painted with his own blood. At the age of 36, the shooting star had shot. Byron's body was embalmed in a vat of brandy and began the arduous journey back to his ancestral home in Nottinghamshire. Finally, I returned to his hometown after following Byron on the extraordinary adventures that took him abroad for half his adult life. He's still a hero to the Greeks, the Albanians and others. But what does he mean to us today? Good evening, welcome to Byron. If you'd like to get that eight-page marathon book ready, just down the road from his ancestral home, I find the name of Byron is still alive. He championed the rights of these people's ancestors, the weavers of Nottingham, in his maiden speech in the House of Lords. For white sources, to someone. Three and nine, thirty-nine. Do you any of you ladies know much about Byron, for example? I mean, does everyone here know things about him? Or? I don't know a lot. I only know he was a poet and he was a bit of a laugh. This one knows he was a sex maniac. Well, she was. Well, she, she was. was. Generation. You know, like in 1933, mm -hmm. two vicars um, opened up the crypt. He was perfectly preserved. But the second thing was he had a gigantic <laughs> erection. <laughs> well, that's about and right, Byron. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, Loads of sex. <laughs> that's the weird thing. He had a, f a tiny foot and a huge cock. Mm -hmm. Very it's difficult to live with those two. That, that. Nature equates. I know exactly. Nature equates. Yeah, you wish you had a little foot. <laughs> no, I wish I had a big cock. Well, you dirty bugger! You dirty old bugger! Don't be so. I can't believe you said that. What? Well, just I can't it. believe you said that either. What, that he wished he had a big cup? I never said that. Well, he can dream, yeah. can't he? He's only imagining what he'd love to have. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to wrap it round his waist trap twice and then tuck it in his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, shall we go on with the bingo now? <laughs> I think we know something about Byron. Who was he really? A cripple? A queer? An aristocrat? A revolutionary? Crippled certainly by shyness when it suited him, and possibly arrogant in the next breath. Brilliantly inconsistent. He was loved and hated with equal fervor. The vast, epic nature of Byron's story can make him remote. But for me, it's his inglorious death and the ultimate failures in his life that make him touching and touchable. And it's for those frailties that I love him. Narrowing the gap between rich and poor when a wealthy family offers a lifeline to a family on the poverty line. How the other half live, Thursday at nine. Next tonight, dirty housemates wrapped in cling film and writhing on the ground. It could only be Big Brother. <laughs>